Hello, and welcome back to the Self Healer Soundboard. This is the How to Do the Work Masterclass, and today we'll be diving into Chapter 2, The Conscious Self, Becoming Aware. Those of you who joined us last week know that we began to explore the mind-body connection. I even took us through a visualization where simply picturing a lemon, for many of us, caused changes in our, in our bodies, in our mouths, increased saliva. We actually tasted that lemon. In this chapter, we're going to dive a bit deeper, and we're going to begin to discover the power of belief. I'm going to read directly from the book. If you are following along at home, it's page 33, The Power of Belief. In 1979, the Harvard psychologist Ellen Langer recruited two groups of elderly men from nursing homes in the Boston area to live for a week in a monastery in New Hampshire and take part in a groundbreaking study on the power of belief and its effects on aging. The first group of men were told to live as if the clock turned back 20 years overnight. They were asked to try to actually live as younger versions of themselves. The second group would remain in the present time period, but were urged to reminisce about the past. Everything in the first group's area of the monastery, which had been decorated for the study, supported the participants' transformations back to their younger selves. The furniture was mid-century modern. Past issues of Life magazine and Saturday Evening Post were scattered around the living quarters. The men watched Ed Sullivan on a black-and-white television, listened to the vintage radio, and screened 1950s movies such as Anatomy of a Murder. They were encouraged to discuss events from the past time, the launch of the first U.S. satellite, Fidel Castro's rise in Cuba, and their fears about escalating Cold War tensions. All mirrors were removed, placed by photographs of the men 20 years earlier. The study lasted one week, and the changes the men experienced were astounding. Both groups showed vast improvements on every measure, from the physical to the cognitive and emotional. All of the men were more flexible, they stooped less, physically, and many of their fingers, riddled with arthritis, were more dexterous and even appeared healthier. Independent onlookers who, unaware of the study, were asked to compare before photos to after photos taken a week later, estimated that the after photos had been taken at least two years prior to the before photos. The changes ran deeper than the physical and were most profound for those who embodied their younger selves. 63% of them demonstrated measurably higher intelligence scores after a week, compared to 44% in the other group. Across the board, all of the men in the first group reported improvements in all five senses, from an ability to taste more flavors in food to better hearing and vision. This little-known study was included because it really highlights for us how important our beliefs are. The only thing that changed in these two groups of elderly men, I just want to point out first and foremost here too, that a lot of us have this belief that once we've reached a certain age, this sort of change isn't possible. So again, here we have a study where we have two groups of elderly men. The only thing that was different in either of these groups was their belief, was embodying this idea or this younger version of themselves. After doing so for, I think it was about a week, these individuals in the group that believed themselves to be younger actually showed those changes in the body. So listeners out there might have heard similar studies around the effects of our positive thoughts and or our negative thoughts. We might have heard concepts like placebo effect, nocebo effect. Essentially here, what we're highlighting, the takeaway message, is that our thoughts really can shape not only our physical experiences, our emotional experiences. The reality for many of us, we are being shaped by thoughts that are occurring outside of our awareness all day long. And this is such a great point, Nicole, because while the reality is that we are being shaped by our thoughts all day long, the majority of us do not realize that we are being shaped by those thoughts all day long, which is a great segue into another section of the book. I'm again going to read directly from the book. If you are following along at home, it's page 25. And the paragraph is, you are not your thoughts. When people hear about my whole person approach to healing, they want to dive right in and meet their inner child, start the reparenting process, do the ego work, remove the trauma. This desire for the quick fix, emblematic of the Western culture in many ways, comes from an understandable want to end the incredible discomfort of living with these wounds. Before we can get to these deeper layers, we first have to gain the ability to witness our internal worlds. It may not sound sexy, but it's fundamental. Everything that follows is grounded in awakening your conscious awareness. 
Now, we see this a lot when people come into our self-healer circle membership. There's this incredible desire to jump in, learn all of the things, fix, heal, and change ourselves all in one felt swoop, which is really understandable once, as we just read there on page 25, when you learn about this whole person approach, when you learn that there is access to these tools, it makes sense that the knowledge and ability to cause true transformation in our lives is incredibly exciting and also shows us the innate and powerful human desire to evolve and to heal. And just like we teach our members in the circle over and over, this eagerness is continuously greeted every time, every enrollment with the same consistent reminder over and over again. I joke with our members all the time in all of our sessions and webinars that I know I sound like a broken record. I know Nicole sounds like a broken record. I know our team does and our content does because over and over we're putting in the same consistent reminders that we must first be able to witness ourselves without judgment, to simply observe ourselves and our thoughts, even and especially in the moments that we'd rather look away than we would look in. And what do I mean by look away? In the moments that, you know, something is it's causing discomfort or it's painful, it's uncomfortable, I don't like it, I don't, I don't want to look, I don't want to deal with it, I want to look away, I want to go make myself busy, I want to do a bunch of other tasks, maybe I want to go and numb myself, I want to dissociate and go away on my spaceship. Now, we see this very commonly. All of these things, as you're listening or watching along, might notice that all those things that you resist, all the things that you look away from, continue to persist. We hear this often across the board. What you resist persists, right? We're talking about the same thing here. It is in those moments where you can embody the reality that you are, we are each the thinker of our thoughts. We're not the thoughts themselves. When I say that, when people read that in the book, I know that the question that almost immediately follows is, well, okay, Nicole, that's fine and great. Well, what am I then? And we get this question a lot and a lot of our self-healers in the circle also ask this question because so many of us are so identified with our thinking mind. We are so, we take our thoughts to be so real um, and we assign so much meaning to our thoughts. Some of us aren't even aware that we're thinking thoughts all day long. We're so merged with that thinking mind as we call it. So what is it? What are we then? We are the consciousness that lives behind the thoughts. We are the state of, as I say, open receptivity that allows us to be that beautiful witness that Jenna is describing, seeing for ourselves those habits and patterns, which for many of us are keeping us stuck. And it's within that space that we can actually begin to embody, as we've been talking about in these past three episodes, choice. We can begin to break some of those habits and patterns that aren't serving us. The beautiful part about this consciousness is that this is actually what, which, what differentiates us from animals. We actually have in a different part of our mind, so right behind our forehead, lives something that's called the prefrontal cortex. Um, this is what, again, separates us from animals because we, unlike them, we can plan for the future. We can reason, we can problem solve. Some of us are almost too good at multitasking and we can think about thought, right? We can observe our thoughts. We're the only creature that has those capabilities. And again, so many of us are, are missing that because we're living, as we've been talking about, merged with our thinking minds, reacting from our autopilot. What is the, the stat, right? Upwards of 90, 95% of our day. So when we talk about consciousness, for a lot of us, this is just a concept, right? Oh, this is a fine idea somewhere out there. How do I actually begin to practice consciousness? And the reality for most of us, definitely myself included, I know I lived my life on that spaceship, we actually have to teach ourselves how to be conscious. We actually have to make new choices, learning how to fire up that prefrontal cortex, part of our mind, our brain. We're actually doing something new. The, the number one practical tool that some of you who have, are in the circle, we definitely have used this on our consciousness building month. All the time. We talk about something called a consciousness check-in, where we harness the reality that most of us are walking around with phones in our pockets. We can utilize that phone and set an alarm on our phone. And every time that phone alarm goes off for some time during our waking day, say I set it for 1 p.m. this afternoon, that alarm goes off. My task is twofold. The first thing I want to do is note, what was I paying attention to? 
Now, if you were me in my past self, I was probably somewhere else, lost in thought, rehashing an argument I had that morning or worrying about an event I have the next day. I wasn't present. And in that moment, what we want to do is fire up that conscious part of our brain. We actually want to teach our, our brain how to be present in a conscious state to the moment. And the best way we can do that is grab a hook for our attention, as I call it. So to refocus, turn that spotlight. So for those of you who are watching YouTube, I make this kind of hand where my spotlight is looking up at my thinking mind. That's what I'm paying most attention to in that moment. And I want to begin to tone that muscle and turn that spotlight from that thinking mind. And we can use two different hooks, depending on what is the easiest for you to hook that attention to. Some of us begin to use our breath. Right, Just follow the normal rhythm. Turn my spotlight from my thoughts to my act of breathing. In that moment, I'm in my conscious mind. Another hook for many of us could be our senses. If maybe we have incense burning in the room or there's music we have on, if we can refocus our attention on our sensory experience, being in our bodies in that moment, again, we're doing the same things in our brain. We're actually harnessing neuroplasticity. The reality is we can fire up our brain in new ways all for the rest of our lives and teach our brain new patterns. And that's what we're talking about here. So consciousness for most of us does remain a concept until you begin to integrate the practice of consciousness in our day to day. And as you do, many of us are then gifted with the reality of this endless narrative that runs through our mind that's coloring our day all day long. I love that visual too. For these consciousness check-ins, as you were talking, I just pictured being in actually quite literally standing in a dark room and that check-in when that alarm goes off, say I, you know, earlier in the morning, I set my phone alarm for 3.32 in the afternoon. I'm going to forget when that rolls around. Suddenly my alarm goes off. I know what it is. It, to me, in my mind, I saw myself then in a dark room. It's like someone switches the lights on. Like now the alarm's off, the lights are on, and all I'm doing is pausing where I am and really just simply looking around me. What are my surroundings? Mm -hmm. What do I hear? What do I feel in my body? Even looking down at my body in that room, what am I wearing? How does it feel? Is the weather warm? Am I inside? Am I outside? Using these tools, like Nicole mentioned, using your senses to ground yourself to those surroundings. So for anyone out there who's visual or wants to try on a visual, you can think of the check-in like that, where quite literally that alarm's going off, the lights are going up. Your only job in that moment is to just simply observe, check in with what's going on around you, what's going on inside your body. That, that act, that alarm going off is the first step. The second step where neuroplasticity comes in that Nicole's mentioning, which I love because it really is you gaining the ability to rewire those neural pathways. You're actually now breaking up this pattern of autopilot that you've just been cruising through through your day, and you now have a tangible and an actual opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to check in. I'm going to break that autopilot habit, habit, and I'm going to use neuroplasticity, the power of it. I'm going to do this check-in to rewire. You're actually creating something new, which builds that muscle of consciousness. We've talked in the earlier episodes And one of our, I think on a podcast before, I used the example of going to the gym and strengthening this muscle. Consciousness is a muscle. We talk about this in the circle all the time. You don't go to the gym right away and list the lift the heaviest weight. You go in and you start small and you continue with repetitions and slowly increase the weight. So over time, you're gaining that strength. The same thing is happening here with consciousness. The first time you might get really thrown when that check-in comes and over and over, you really start to strengthen and rewire, creating a new pattern of actual conscious choice and conscious existence and conscious awareness. I was smiling as you were describing all that, Jenna, because I think for some of us, and just here listening, it sounds so simplistic. Oh, mm-hmm. just tune in. What's going on in your body? What's going on in <laughs> Hello your Hello in there. <laughs> and again, I'm the first person to admit when I was on my spaceship, when I tuned, I had no idea. I couldn't tell you what sensations my body was having, having in that moment. I couldn't necessarily even tell you what was happening in the external world. I know for me, I've watched many a movie. You know, in front of me, the movie is happening, though 
I am not registering the movie. Mm -hmm. I'm not paying attention. I don't remember the movie afterward. That movie was my life. So as simplistic as some of this sounds, um, there is so much power in it because I think a lot of you out there listening are like me. We actually have no idea what's going on in our current moment externally, even more so, even fewer of us have any idea what's going on internally. So again, the importance of this practice, the importance of teaching your mind, your brain, how to be in that space where it can begin to register what's going on internally and again, what's going on externally. Mm -hmm. And the importance of this practice really is that it's foundational. Everything that we're building on the journey of healing, all long-term and lasting transformation needs to be built on a foundation of consciousness, which is why I joke that we do sound like broken records over and over again. It's very mindful and very intentional because we need to build first a foundation of this. Um, something you were just saying made me think of a member in the circle, like Nicole was saying, you know, you might not even you might not know what's going on in your body. And that was a great experience for me too with some of our members where we were working on emotions and witnessing our body, you know, feeling it through our body, what the physical symptoms are. And without giving too many examples away so that we're not just feeding everyone all the things to say and really allowing and creating a space of personal discovery, I was met with some members that, you know, couldn't couldn't yet get to the place of even noticing that their palms were sweaty or their heart was racing in a moment. They wanted the example of it because they were so, still so on autopilot, still so off in a spaceship, watching that movie, not having any interaction or relation to what's actually happening. They weren't here in their body. They were just lost in that thought stream on that autopilot, which is why, you know, setting this alarm, creating some kind of abrupt check-in to really just sit and tune in then gives you a starting ground. It gives you a foundation where if you don't notice the physical sensations in your body or you're not tuned into how you're feeling that day, that's okay. This is the opportunity then when that alarm goes off to sit and check in and really just do a body scan and stand there. And for me, it's the visual of being in that dark room and the lights switch on. Well, now I'm actually standing there and kind of looking down at my feet, just thinking, okay, what do I feel in my body? Am I hot? Am I cold? Is my heart racing? How is my breathing? Really just kind of doing a scan and checking in, which again, we know can sound so mundane. And if you really stop to think about it or witness yourself for a day or two, I think we might all be pretty shocked at how often we go through the majority of our day. I think, what was that stat? Like 95% of our day, we are just off in our subconscious and this autopilot kind of in a flowing river that, that we're not directing at all. Yeah. So we met this autopilot too, that we talked a bit about because it often does look like reactivity or those roles that we play. We met this in a question um, from one of our listeners. I think it was on last week's episode, though. We meet this in the chapter where we meet Jessica, um, a patient that I had for quite some time who, as part of her autopilot, she was actually trapped in cycles of reactivity, right? So cycles for Jessica of chronic anxiety, coupled with a need or a felt need to please others, which on the outside, very similar to myself, looked like high achieving per perfectionism. She was very quote unquote successful in life in many ways. Though the reactivity comes in, right? Where as a result of th believing our thoughts. So this is what is important to understand about Jessica. Mm -hmm. Jessica really highlights, and I have a, a, a sentence in the book that I just wanna note here. Every thought that crossed her mind became a belief, a communication expressed by herself. So Jessica really provides us with this example of that merger, right? So when Jessica, I'm really going to simplify this. When Jessica had a positive thought about her life, things are going great in her relationship, Jessica believed that thought to be true. So then began to operate in the world in a quote unquote positive way. Similarly, when Jessica entertained negative thoughts, she would, it would affect her mood. She'd feel negative and then she'd shift into her cycle of reactivity, which for Jessica looked like, similar again to myself, a lot of numbing, a lot of distancing from, from uncomfortable feelings in that numbing behaviors, usually through substance use or reactivity, yelling, screaming at, at her partner, 
there would become shame. And then we would see a shame cycle, Mm -hmm. right? This cycle of now I feel bad about what I said and what I did when I was believing my thoughts and feelings. And now I have to engage in another form of distancing, right? So here goes the snowball down the mountain to cope with that shame. So now I'm numbing, I'm numbing myself further. And again, I'm still trapped in that cycle of reactivity. An important thing to highlight, and I talk about this concept in in the chapter, I bring up a part of our, or a function of our subconscious mind, because now I think as those of you are making your way through the book or listening to this master class, we're beginning to understand how powerful our subconscious lives. So just to be clear, when Jenna and I speak of these habits, these patterns, so for instance, this cycle of reactivity, we're talking about it living in our subconscious, which again, upwards of 90% of our day, that's where we're reacting from. Our subconscious operates on a principle that is called the homeostatic impulse. And what that means is any time, right, we try to make a movement outside of those familiar patterns that we're now used to, the thoughts that we always think, the ways that we always feel, the things that we always do upon those feelings, any time we venture into that unfamiliar, now again, those of you who have been listening to this masterclass understand by now that according to our subconscious, the unfamiliar is threatening to be avoided at all cost. So what happens to to regulate myself back, to to wrangle myself back into that familiar, that familiarity that my subconscious prefers, I meet resistance. Resistance for us can live in our minds or in our bodies. For some of us, that looks like, okay, I've set an intention to change. I'm going to do this new thing in this moment. And now my mind backs up with all of the reasons why that's not a good idea right now, why I should be doing a million other things with my time. For some of us, it drops into our bodies. We begin to just feel a little different, a little agitated in a new way, just not like ourselves. So that impulse, when I react now to that discomfort, that resistance, for many of us, before I know it, I'm right back into those familiar patterns. I describe this again because so many of us begin to carry shame. I know Jessica did. Jessica, during one of our sessions, blurted out, you know, from a hopeless place, is this even working? And again, a lot of us are like Jessica. We're cycling through reactivity. We're unable to create those choices, make those new changes. And if and when we attempt to, before we know it, that resistance is too strong. I feel too overwhelmed and I'm right back in those familiar ruts. This, Jessica, is such a well-depicted avatar or representation of, I think, how a lot of us out there feel when it comes to being on the journey and suddenly feeling stuck, being in this so-called like Groundhog's Day where you can kind of, now we can see that there's patterns. Okay, great. We got it, Jenna and Nicole. Mm -hmm. There's patterns. There's these behaviors. I want to change them. I have access to change them. I have the power to do it. (laughs) I have all the tools. And yet it's Groundhog's Day again and again and again. What gives? And this is where... And again, it's we are going to repeat ourselves again here where it does take that breaking of a pattern. It does take commitment. It does take practice and practice and practice on your end to choose to break that pattern, to break that thought process while it's happening, which is why we really create a lot of space in teaching around just simply first, you have to become aware. You have to just become an aware, objective observer of the thoughts, all your thoughts and feelings that are coming and going, anything that comes and goes is not you. You are the awareness and the observer of them. So as we're able to acknowledge that and see that we're the observer, okay, great, now I'm there, I'm in step one, and yet I'm still in Groundhog's Day again. So now what gives? Now it really is important to remember that you have to keep showing up to the gym again. You have to practice again and again and again. For me, this still you might be able to relate. I would go into little less now on a good day, not so much. On a day that's not as good, I I will still spiral. In the morning, if I've got a morning routine planned or I have, you know, these are all the things I want to do. I want to journal. I want to meditate. And if you're someone like me, I have my endless to-do list and dream list of like all the things that I want to do, not all of which gets checked off, but it's at least a guide for me. So as I'm going about this, if something derails or I want to go and take a shower and someone's in there and it gets me off, I'll start to shame or start to spiral, you know, okay, well, that got admitted. It's now 
10 a.m. and I've only gotten three things on my list done instead of 12 things. And while this might sound, um, it could sound a little dramatic in some <laughs> ways, I I definitely get that and can acknowledge that. And in that moment, that spiral is so deep and so ingrained where I will watch myself. And there's times now where I'm able to watch myself watching myself. And if I'm low on resources, I'm not able to grasp and, and step out of that cycle. But I'll see myself kind of spiral in the shame of like, well, you didn't get any of that done or you didn't get X done. So now your day is ruined. So now it's, 8, 9, 10 a.m. and your whole day is derailed and destroyed because it didn't go as planned. And I was talking to my twin brother somewhat recently and he had something kind of a similar thing where he'd shared his plan, something happened, and it was an immediate just a downward spiral of how the rest of the day was ruined, like just a lot of really critical talk and a lot of judgment. And it being my twin was a really powerful and unique opportunity for me to witness, whoa, this is this literally is my mirror and we shared a womb, I see myself doing this too. And there are times when I found myself in that moment of spiral where, like I said, I'm able to witness myself witnessing myself. And it's, it's then my choice. I can choose to break it or I can choose to not. And in full transparency, sometimes because it is my comfort, it's also, it's what my ego knows. It was my safety. There are certainly times where I'll just choose to sit in it. I I'd rather shame. I'd rather be critical. I'd rather judge. I'd rather go through the spiral and say the whole day is now destroyed. And then there's other moments where I've got a little more resources and I come to and I consciously choose to actually kind of break in there like Nicole referenced as that hook and hook in and say, okay, Jenna, actually you're good. Just come back to the present. For me, I always put my hands on my heart and just take a deep breath and really actually spend a moment coming back to my body. Throughout, If you spend time around me, you'll see throughout my day, it's very noticeable when I do place my hands to my heart and I do take a deep, a deep breath and an inhale and exhale and really just bring myself back to the present. And I watch that spiral keep going in my head and just kind of let it float away and continue as I really ground myself in the present moment and then make a new choice to create a new pattern. Thank you for sharing that. And those of you who have read the book, um, read about my own cycles of reactivity mm. um, as I was reacting all over the streets of New York. And very interestingly <laughs> enough, um, when I was revisiting this chapter to know that we were going to be discussing this here today, and I was rereading that part, um, I was brought back to, you know, how helpless, how reactive I felt. Um, and around that time, my mom was going through some health issues um, and my anxiety was at an all time high and I was very reactive. Similar on the days I got a good report, my mom was stable, everything seemingly was OK. I felt OK. I felt, you know, able to continue on. On the days, however, where I got that bad report that maybe my mom wasn't going to be okay, maybe things aren't, you know, going to get better, I just, just like Jessica, would hook and my whole day then would be destabilized. I would be experiencing extreme anxiety. The reason I bring that up now, I'm actually um, going through something very similar with my mom now who's having some current health issues, as, as Jenna knows and those close to me know. However, and I took this moment to really honor myself, the difference now is that's still the case for me. When I get good news, quote unquote, about my mom and or bad news, I still have feelings, right? I can still feel mm -hmm. upset, um, scared, you know, all of the things when it's when it's not the report that I want to get. And or I can feel hopeful when it does, you know, feel like, oh, okay, things are moving now in a positive direction. However, what's different is I'm, I'm viewing it, I'm witnessing it from a stable ground. I don't have to react and then base my decisions from those feelings, which I've now learned are temporary. Um, because just as much as the good news could have me on a high today, the bad news could come crushing down tomorrow. So the point of this goal, and I, I mean, the point of this work and, and the, the empowerment that we're speaking of is learning how to show up consciously. That doesn't mean that as I hear the news reports from my mom about my mom's health now, it doesn't mean I don't feel. It just now means I don't react from those feelings. And I don't, like Jessica then, find a snowball of shame and of numbing and a further distraction. Now I can just allow myself to be 
with the very real feelings that are underneath. So going back to what we were talking about earlier, right? Those are the moments to explore what is coming up as this news about mom is coming in for me. Now I don't have to wave in the wind like Jessica mm -hmm. does. Um, I don't have to, you know, follow my thoughts and take them so literally. I can come back, I can ground myself, I can understand and allow my feelings to be what they are, and I can still make choices from a grounded place. So again, I wanna share that, you know, as, as Jenna did on the hopeful side. Doesn't mean that life changed around me. My mom's still going through the same thing. It doesn't mean that I don't have difficult feelings to navigate. It just means that I'm setting myself up to not complicate it, to not mm -hmm. feel shame, and then the need to distance or distract myself and or hurt others and those I love in the process. One of the things that I really love about this work is that as being a human being, we are unique in a lot of the things and abilities that we are able to do, one of which is this ability to reflect. It's a very uniquely human trait to be able to sit, reflect back on where we were. Now, while I mentioned that it's the reflection and really Nicole being able to be still, to be able to lean into herself, to be able to reflect and to learn herself that allowed for this really great acknowledgement and honoring to come forth. It reminded me of an experience that I had with my family back in October um, that I wasn't really present to right away. It wasn't through my own reflection that I learned it, but I was back home, um, hadn't been there for a while. I had seen, I've mentioned previously, whether on lives or some episodes, I've sort of rekindled relationships um, with my immediate family and had you know, spent about a decade not speaking or talking to my older brother for various reasons. There was a span of three or four years where I really also detached myself from my mom. I didn't go back to New York where I'm originally from. I didn't visit and I really took that distance. And a lot of that was because of my own reactivity to them. Uh, there would be, you know, without going too deep into it on this episode, but just arguments, the reactivity of the other person, a really toxic or unhealthy and traumatic situation. I knew that I was still evolving in a place of my healing where I couldn't sit with certain things. If someone got, you know, really short tempered or really angry with me or said something that was really just crossed a boundary or was traumatic or unsafe in a lot of ways, I was very reactive to that. And then it would just, you know, result in a massive uproar. So as I took my space away for really ever since I was 18, I left and never really went back, but taking space away during those years where there really wasn't communication and really focusing and leaning into me, my own my own emotional reactivity and my own healing. I now am able to kind of use going back to New York. I share this with uh, Nicole and her partner all the time. Going home for me is almost like a science or a social experiment where I actually get to be a really great witness to myself because I have all of these past memories of different stages of Jenna from back in New York, whether it was, you know, the young kid, then teenager, maybe popping back in my 20s, this whole little trauma roller coaster, right? So I have this past experience of myself in all of those different times. And then I'm always away. The majority of my life, I've spent more life away from New York than I ever did in it, kind of raising myself, really. And when I go back, I'm able to remember the last time that I was there and really kind of see, and I'm a very visual person, so in my brain, it is like a straight line that goes across. And it's almost like these little markers of evolution and healing and transformation come up for me. And to wrap it back to how I intro to this, it wasn't through my own reflection that I saw this last one, but I was back there in October. I was super just, and I could feel it. Like my heart felt calm. I really was just embodying like patience, all these things that sound like, oh great and so wonderful, I want that. Well, you can have that. And it, it took years and years of intentional work and practice. And I really had such a beautiful experience for three days with them, you know, took us all out to eat, was just rubbing my mom's back at dinner, really engaging with her in moments that other people might be really, you know, just embarrassed or certain scenarios. It's family, right? So we're all very touchy-feely. And something about it just felt so calm and so beautiful. Now, my brothers had a different reaction. They haven't spent the last years on the same journey that I've been in. And when I got back to LA, I got a call from my twin brother who 
was like, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of you. And I thought, oh, like, you know, great. I'm really proud of me too. I'm like hanging out. I'm working with Nicole. I'm doing everything I said that I would be doing. Like, this is great. And I just gave him space to talk more. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of you because I watched. He's like, I watched when you were home last time in all these moments. It makes me choked up. He said, I just, I watched how you were. I watched all of the things that you do, the things that you'd say, and the things that you didn't say. And I love how much that moves me even now. I'm trying to, so you can hear me clearly, kind of calm that down. But it's, I love how much that moves me because it's such a strong testament to actually actually being the embodiment of the thing that we're saying, where me actually getting to being on this journey, going through my own healing, putting these tools into practice, quite literally building that consciousness, like going to the gym over time was able to manifest in a a really beautiful way where as Nicole sharing about her family and she notices the different emotional response she has to it now, I didn't necessarily witness that response in real time for myself, but it was that phone call from my twin later who was able to say to me, you know, I saw, I notice, I get to, I want that. Like now there's, now there's opportunity for those around you to also see that that's possible and to see that you can respond differently for someone who shares my same blood who shared a womb with me to see me respond and react drastically differently than I ever had in my entire life also was a really powerful signal and cool experience for him to realize oh wait I can do this like this really is a pathway in my brain that I actually can interject I can do the work to change how I respond and really just become conscious and calm and loving which ultimately is where our healing takes us. In my opinion, that that is the greatest teacher, us mm-hmm. embodying change for ourselves. Because I know one of the most frequently asked questions that I know you also get in the circle, you know, is how do I change? <laughs> Insert whoever, my partner, my mom. How mm-hmm. do I get someone to do something differently so that I can experience this relationship differently? And again, that's coming from a very well-intentioned place, oftentimes from a very uncomfortable place where we do acknowledge the need to create change. So again, the pathway of pointing the finger and ultimatum, making someone do something differently isn't the way that we actually inspire change. We inspire change just like Jenna beautifully described, like I'm describing. We inspire change when we begin to show up differently. Now, that's not to say that all of the reactions are as positive um, from those around us. So (laughs) Jenna's brother, right, saw that and saw the possibility in that. If you can have this, maybe I can too. Not all of us immediately see that possibility. Some of us, right, see and experience the change of another. So as we maybe go home and we embody a new self, we might not actually get that positive reaction. We might actually get something that feels much more negative, Mm -hmm. again, for lack of a better word. And again, because as we change and as we are different in a relationship, not everyone welcomes that unfamiliar space. Their subconscious is involved all the same. They don't know what to do with this new discomfort or how they're now experiencing you in this new way, and they might not react in possibility. They might actually react in a way that then makes us or we end up feeling badly. So I just want to honor all aspects of this experience. Um, Change is hard. It's hard for all of the relationships that will be impacted because as we change, we do create change in the Mm -hmm. relationships around us, in my opinion, in the world around us. And that's why we're doing this work. It's just not as direct as we think. We don't point a finger and ask the world to change. We begin to show up differently, show up from this conscious space where I can begin to make choices that are more in alignment with the self within and not from these reactive patterns. So similarly, in terms of this note, I know we have three call-in questions um, that are going to talk about different aspects of this consciousness building journey. So right now, we're going to hear from Mateo. Hello, Dr. Nicole. Um, It's Mateo Martinez calling from Sterling, Illinois. And I was wondering if it is normal and is it okay for us to go in autopilot mode? Um, Because I often find myself becoming consciously aware that I'm going on autopilot mode and I kind of bash myself. So I was wondering, is it good for us or is it healthy for us to go on autopilot mode? Such a great question, Mateo. Um, so I, autopilot is, is natural. 
like we've been talking about, our brain prefers to coast um, in terms of calories. When we're firing from that subconscious space, yeah. we're actually conserving our calories. We're conserving our attention. We're allowing those resources to be freed up to do other things. And to be human, we have quite a lot going on. So it's normal. It's also normal because like we've been talking about, we prefer the familiar. You know, evolutionarily, it's kept us safe. Knowing what to predict has quite literally kept our species alive. So Mateo, anyone else out there who has a similar question, autopilot is normal. Um, it's part of the human experience, as is, as we've been talking about, the homeostatic impulse. All of the resistance happens as we begin to create change, begin to step out of those familiar patterns into the unfamiliar, right? That resistance comes, all the endless thoughts of why this isn't going to work this time. Maybe I just feel uncomfortable in my body. And before I know it, again, I'm in those familiar patterns. So what's important here is to first acknowledge how normal it is. Because I know a lot of us, especially my old clients, would carry a lot of shame, would begin to endorse these ideas like, oh, maybe I'm broken. Maybe there's some reason, some deeper reason. This isn't the journey or the path I'm meant to go in life. Again, if you are struggling to change, if you see yourself shifting into autopilot, if you see yourself living in autopilot, it's a quite a natural human experience. The work here, right, the practice here is like Jenna offered earlier to begin to break that habit of judgment, right? Hearing those critical voices in our mind and beginning to use more neutral language so that we can become an objective witness around those patterns. Here's where we can then get curious, right? Begin to explore when are the moments? When is it that I'm more likely to shift into that autopilot? Because for a lot of us, autopilot might be our safety zone. It might be that distraction, that distance. It might be our spaceship, keeping us away from feelings that are or at one time were too overwhelming. So very, in my, own, in my own journey, I still have moments where I observe myself, I witness myself being compelled, wanting to shift in that autopilot, just like Jenna was describing. Um, while you know I have been able to create change, find some new conscious awareness in some aspects of my life, when it's my deepest wound, for those of you who know me, know my work, maybe have read the rest of the book, know one of my deepest wounds is any moment where I perceive myself not to be considered in any way. My thoughts, my feelings, me, my way of being. In those moments, it's still a slippery slope. <laughs> my autopilot, I'd rather distance, detach, act like it doesn't bother me. So again, autopilot is quite normal. Mateo, anyone else listening who sees autopilot in their given any given day, this is a moment where we can get curious. We can understand maybe what is going on in the deeper sense. We can look within, like we've been talking about as we began this episode here today, and explore, is my autopilot in this moment my safety mechanism, my distance from something that might be deeper and much more uncomfortable? Thank you, Nicole, for sharing that. I giggle a little bit because we, we talk often about, you know, all of the things that are us and Nicole's not being considered and what that slippery slope looks like. And I know you'll hear mine as well, the autopilot or where I go, we deal with on a daily basis. So it does make me chuckle. Um, Mateo, in your voicemail, I do, I was writing a note as I listened to it again. I love that you say you catch yourself, you know, becoming critical and then wondering if it's okay to be on autopilot. And it's, I just really want to honor and really highlight for everyone who's watching or and listening that that moment of catching yourself is, is really powerful. That's you then becoming this, you are the awareness in that moment. You're being the objective observer that even though you're then still going down the path, you know, shame kicks in, judgment kicks in. I got it. That does happen to us. And it's really important to take that minute and really celebrate and bring some compassion and love to yourself for the fact that you've inserted that hook. You've become the awareness and the observer in that moment to begin to break the pattern. And as we mentioned earlier, you know, it's kind of like Groundhog's Day. Well, great. Now I'm the observer observing it and I'm still stuck in this thing. That's okay. It just, it takes practice and continued practice. And that moment of catching yourself becoming that, you know, judge or that self-critic is a really great opportunity for you to also reframe. And instead of continuing to go down, it maybe just be like, oh, hey, I caught it. Okay, I'm going to pause here and really just acknowledge myself for catching myself here. Now, 
while Nicole shares her deep wound around not being considered, I have this, what to me seemed kind of odd at first, a deep wound around joy and excitement, um, which you can imagine has been interesting, launching a podcast, launching a book, having it be a number one New York Times bestseller. Nicole's giggling because she knows the behind the scenes of, quite, quite interesting. of what it actually looks like and what it actually looks like to be with someone who is never considered. <laughs> so you've got not considered over here and then you have, well, I can't express joy or excitement over here because it's a trauma and a trigger. So I, while that may sound odd for some, I know there's probably others out there listening or watching who may may also get that. And it really, for me, understanding and seeing this, um, I just started to notice, like anytime there is joy, anytime there's a big thing to be excited about, I just start to float over here and like quietly walk away and disappear. And I wasn't aware of that at first. I've noticed throughout my life, you know, I it is difficult for me or seemingly difficult to express joy or to express excitement, to get really thrilled about something and then have and show the self-expression of it. That to me is like major discomfort. I could stand in front of you and talk to a million people, but but genuinely self-express that I'm thrilled or joyous about something. So over time, I've been able to understand and at least be witness to the fact that, oh, okay, well, here's another moment of excitement. Here's another moment of joy. Here's that discomfort again. And through choosing to do the work and really sit and learn myself and spend time with myself and really be that observer and have that awareness over it, I started to see that pattern. And it was through creating a conversation of self-compassion and really bringing love to myself, which is why, Mateo, I mentioned, you know, use that moment of catching yourself to kind of reframe and really acknowledge yourself. Because while joy and excitement may be really uncomfortable for me over time, I started to even reframe, oh, it's uncomfortable again. Okay, good job, Jenna, for noticing that. And over time, continuing to notice and continuing to get curious to speak to Nicole's point, that curiosity, and again, I'll reference this with, you know, lots for me, it's been years of work and years on this journey where it actually was able to unlock a memory for me from childhood. Now, I don't remember the majority of my childhood. I was definitely away on a spaceship, not there for it. And after practicing consistently sitting and being with myself and really bringing compassion to myself instead of making myself wrong for feeling the way that I would, when I'd bring compassion and love and get curious, it brought me back to an actual moment when I was about, I think, six or seven. I was on the bus um, on the way home from school and we were at this point potentially losing our house. Um, if you've heard on previous podcasts or other podcasts, I've described a little bit of my upbringing, which was very much in extreme poverty. I mean, we went through periods where we didn't have shelter, we didn't have food, we you know lived off of donations and the people around us. And then there's other parts where it seems the polar opposite in photos. So I get where that can be a little confusing, but I give that context here. So you can just have a little bit of an understanding that this moment was I'm six or seven, all that's going on in the background. We're potentially using losing our house. So to me, I have no real relationship to that. I'm like, all right, well, it's a house. I love it. We might be losing it. Okay. No, no negative, no positive, just kind of is. So I get off the school bus and I, my mom is at the bus stop and I go and I run up to my mom's arms super fast and jump in her arms. I'm like, mommy, mommy, do we get to keep the house? And my mom is absolutely mortified and like immediately it sets me back down on the ground, gets really stern, may have scolded me, I'm not sure what. And I realized in that moment for her, she's super embarrassed. She's going through her own trauma. I don't think anyone around us really knows anything that's happening. So there's this one instance where I show this extreme excitement and I'm instantly set down on the ground. This same thing then I see in like the next year and the following year. And again, I didn't have these memories originally. These were unlocked for me through practice, which may happen for some, may not for others. I'm just sharing to give a little bit of an example here. There were two other times when my parents separated. They had a really really traumatic separation and divorce. There was a lot of physical and emotional abuse there. So we weren't to see my father. We were supposed to have supervised visitation with my father maybe once a month. He ended up, you know, through his own trauma, he left. I didn't see him for a period of 14 years and 
We've rekindled since later. But at this period, there was a lot of battle and pinning mom against dad. Dad was against mom. Mom was against dad. So I hadn't seen my father for a long period of time. My mother did not trust us being around my father. And there were two instances where I had just been with my dad for a week and then I I got back to my mom. So it was back to her custody. So she's great, has us back. I'm super excited to see her. I run up into my mom's arms both times like, you know, hey, mommy, hi, so glad to see you. And she, instead of hugging me back, just pulls me off her body, puts me down on the ground and looks me dead in the eye and says, Jenna, do not ever hug your father like that. And it was that closeness, that insecurity of what she thought was happening as far as some kind of abuse went, where she didn't want me to have that connection. So for me, this is important to note, it was that moment of excitement again. This is the same instance where now I have three times in a couple of years where I go and I show this authentic self-expression, this like joyous child, not thinking anything of it. I go and embrace someone that I love and trust with all this joy and excitement. And I'm immediately met with this scowling face, complete shutdown, and she's going through her own trauma. So what actually happened for me was in those moments, it created a filter. It allowed my subconscious mind to actually lovingly protect me by saying, we're not going to go there anymore. We're not going to have excitement and joy. We're not going to self-express in that way because we see what it's met with. So what actually happened was kind of like a, a light switch going on and off where I sort of just wrote that off. And from then, throughout the rest of my life up until now, there's that same discomfort, that same fear of expressing that as if I'll be met with the same response. So having this awareness now is really powerful for me to to now be, be the observer who can come in with those hooks, who can see, oh, the book's the number one New York Times bestseller. That's pretty cool. Jenna, why are you flatlining? Why are you numb to it? Why are you scared to express and show excitement? And when I'm able to get curious and be compassionate with myself, I can see, oh, you're doing that thing again. You're going through that wound again because it still isn't healed. Thank you for sharing all that, Jenna. And that's what is really, really important to understand here. All of these, most of the habits and patterns that we're cycling through are out of protection. Mm. And so many of us from that instinctive place, anytime we have maybe even just a feeling in general, regardless of what it is, definitely for a lot of us, when it's what we would call a negative feeling, we judge ourselves before we pull it back, right? And begin to explore. We might not know, you know, that memory might not come up immediately what it is. Well, why is this this feeling something I'm judging? Though if we explore and if we drop in, oftentimes, always, typically, there is that reason. Mm-hmm. There is the thing that happened um, that, again, we've been operating from a protective place, trying to avoid going back. So why curiosity is important. We miss out on the opportunity to do any of this exploration when we just go into that snap judgment. And then once we follow the snap judgment with a reaction that again, we can feel shameful about later, that cycle of Jessica continues. So it's in those moments, beginning to embody that consciousness and getting curious because once we get curious, we can understand why we feel so strongly or understand why we're so hesitant or resistant to certain feelings. Because likely there was something that Mm -hmm. happened at some time where there was a threat or there was a lack of safety in that particular experience. So we actually get really adaptive. We're quite savvy Mm -hmm. as humans. However, the adaptations, all of those ways that we've coped to avoid that deep painful thing often carry their own consequences. So shifting a bit, we have one more, two more questions. Um, This one is from Ketsia. So Ketsia has a question that I think will resonate with a lot of you listeners out there. Hi, I am Ketsia. I'm calling in from Connecticut and I'm actually calling about chapter two, the conscious self. Um, And I had a question just because um, I've learned about how to be conscious on my healing journey um, from uh, Dr. Nicole. So, you know, I'm super grateful. Um, but I'm trying to apply it to my life and it's really hard because it's like, I'll be out, for example, like just out and about. And it's like in any one moment, I'm like trying to hold all these things in like my consciousness at one moment. So I'm like, okay, all right. So I didn't learn this in childhood, but I need to like be able to do this thing in adulthood. Like I need to be able to be proactive and I need to, 
um, like be my own parent and I need to uh, do like something like practical like in this moment like hand this cashier the money and then I need to like manage this interaction and like so you know maybe my brain works a little bit differently but I'm just wondering how do you stay conscious and like have all of these things that you're trying to do in any one moment um, when you're essentially trying to like raise yourself um, in adulthood so I uh, hope that wasn't like just jumbled um but that is my question so thank you so much for holding this space and i hope to hear from you guys soon all right bye-bye such a good and quite common question uh, that i get ketsia and to acknowledge a very beautiful uh, statement you made in there which is yes we are essentially raising ourselves in adulthood however the action of raising ourselves in adulthood is an embodiment practice, right? It doesn't happen in our thinking mind. And I get questions like this often because I do, a lot of us, when we begin to do the work and we begin to understand that there's, you know, certain things that we could begin to consider in any given moment, we shift up into our thinking mind. And what we can call this is overanalyzing. We're overthinking our way through because to speak to Ketsia's point, there is a lot in any given moment that we could be tending to, there's a lot of stimulation being human. We have to choose what it is that we're going to pay attention to in our external environment. We have to do similarly in our internal environment. And as you begin to learn some of these concepts, we have a lot of shoulds running through our mind. <laughs> However, again, the distinction here is between overanalyzing, which is an action of overthinking. We're still in our thinking mind, versus again, dropping into that consciousness space that we've been talking about, that state of open receptivity where we're not just tuned into the thoughts in our mind, we're actually not really tuned into that at all. We're tuned into our bodies, how our body is feeling in any given moment and allowing that to be the space from which we choose our responses. So what we're working to do is not overthink. Um, it's actually to drop in again to that state of conscious awareness. We want to do that. Consciousness often is a function of our bodies. Like we've been talking about using the hook of our breath, using the hook of our senses. Anytime we turn that spotlight of attention or we turn the lights on, like Jenna worded it earlier, what we're present to is our body and how our body is reacting or responding to any given moment. We're actually not in our thinking mind at all. We're not running through all of the steps that I could take. We're dropping in and we're saying, how does my body feel in this moment, right? And once we begin to attune ourselves to our bodies, that's actually where we begin to respond from. Now, of course, this is a practice um, and this practice is, like we were talking about earlier, the consciousness check-in. We wanna expand the amount of time we're practicing that. So going from setting the alarm from one time a day to two to three to learning how to drop in and out of that space in real time. Of course, in real time when life's happening and there is a cashier in front of us and there is a loud person yelling behind me, it gets much more difficult to drop in and to hear that inner space. That's when it's most important to do it. That's again, the least, the last place to change. We wanna practice being conscious and that's why we talk about creating moments for ourselves maybe having a meditation practice where we actually close our eyes and tune out of the external world because that will strengthen our tool so that when we go out, go forth, go into that supermarket where there will be other humans, right? Then we can give ourselves the opportunity to navigate that space from a conscious place. So the practical tip and tool is build those conscious check-in moments, expand them, the amount of time that you're spending in that conscious state internally will help you when you externally go about the world. And we have all of these things now to be reacting to. I'm even doing that right now as we're talking. And as I was speaking before, I noticed, and shout out to Claire, who left a comment on Instagram that asked me to talk slower. I am noticing that even now. So as I'm talking, there's this, like, I call it a hamster wheel. There's all these thoughts and concerns and considerations that are going on up here. Like, Jenny, you said the wrong thing. You're talking too fast. They're not going to understand you. You repeated that. There's a whole a whole arena of mm -hmm. thoughts and considerations and concerns always swirling around in my mind. And what Nicole's referencing here is overanalyzing is this, for me, is kind of a 
being hyper focused on our mind. So when we're being hyper focused on being conscious, um, we're actually taking ourselves away from the greatest access to consciousness, which is being in our bodies, like Nicole's saying, going from your thinking mind and into your feeling body. So like she's saying, turning those lights on or moving that spotlight with that consciousness check-in or just spending time with yourself. I'm going to reiterate this and just highlight it again that leaning into yourself, learning yourself, really for a lot of us will come from taking that time and maybe it's uncomfortable time to really just sit still and to sit with yourself and be yourself. You learn everyone around you on a daily basis. You really also deserve and need for your healing to sit and spend time with yourself and just observe you, observe how it does feel in your body, what thoughts are going around in your head or as what I call my hamster wheel that's always constantly going in the moment. And as that's happening, again, for me, I always instinctively just put my hands to my heart. Feeling my heartbeat is an immediate way for me to come back. So in any moment, coming back to not just continuously breathing throughout the day, the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, your body breathes on its own. But actually choosing to take a deep inhale, take a deep exhale, set aside time, even if it's 10 minutes of nothing planned, set aside 10 minutes of just quiet time to be with yourself, do a mental scan of your body to bring yourself away from your thinking mind and into your feeling body. Body. And the deeper reason why this is so incredibly important is because we're we're ever changing creatures. Mm. Our bodies are quite literally aging. Our needs will change. So, Ketsia, anyone else out there thinking that the answers are in our thinking mind? If we come up with a protocol, to how to you know how to parent, reparent at me and my adult self, that protocol might change mm-hmm. as I enter my forties, as I enter my fifties. So. The deeper reason why we want to always tune back in internally and and allow our bodies to to express its needs is because those needs are Mm ever-changing. So looking for the script in our mind or even the protocol that worked last week might shift and change as my body shifts and changes into tomorrow. So even more importantly, developing that internal guidance, that intuition, that inner knowing allows us to then honor our body's ever-changing needs, our emotions' ever-changing needs, and the fact that we create new relationships and we evolve as humans. That's the reality we're living. We don't say script it. So if we continue to look for a consistent script um, to help me navigate you know, a future that I can't yet predict, I might be setting myself up to not actually be attuning to my needs. So again, our needs, Ketsia, anyone else out there listening that is ever distracted with all of these things I could or should be doing, I assure you the answers are going to lie as we shift that spotlight and as we begin to attune to our body. Your body will tell you, your emotional centers, your energy shifts and changes will tell you what it needs as it shifts and changes. I... I'm a very a very visual person and love looking at the body for me as it's a it's a perfect biocomputer and in that biocomputer is there's a tech room where there's all of the computers that are making all of my body run and when there's a fire in the computer room if something's if something's awry or I've hurt myself or something's going off my body usually is sending signs and symptoms and signals they're always there and it takes these moments of consciousness of checking in to intentionally tune into your body to even be able to have to know that they're there to even be able to have awareness of what it may or may not be saying like nicole is mentioning it it is always communicating with you and your body is always evolving and when you mentioned nicole uh you know we have our intuition which is always guiding us as soon as i hear that i think back to the circle where the response back from a lot of members is, well, how do I listen to my intuition? How do I know what my intuition is? How do I hear it? And really that intuition is the second step to the prelude of really just spending time with yourself in your body in observation that actually gives way to then being able to listen to what it's saying. 
Yeah. So again, back to this embodiment practice, um, overanalyzing is still an action of the thinking mind. Again, mm -hmm. another area we could get curious. Are there certain moments where you're likely, Ketsi or anyone else out there who has a similar question, right? Are there moments where we tend to be in that overanalytical space? Um, there might be some deeper information there. Though, again, the goal is to drop into the body. Um, when we're in that state of consciousness, we're not actually thinking. We're receptive. We see thoughts, right? Remember, we're the person who's the entity that's able to witness. We are not the thoughts themselves. So overthinking, overanalyzing is following that train of thinking, again, for many of us into a direction that isn't always helpful. So we have one more question. Um, I believe her name is Dorothy. Dorothy. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Dorothy and I'm calling from Canada. Uh, my question for chapter two of the book is, um, uh, I guess in terms of becoming uh, more self-aware and conscious of yourself, um, how do you know when you have reached the ideal level of becoming self-aware, like the ideal level of consciousness, uh, so that you can keep working uh, on yourself on on these harder items like uh, like trauma and like um, I guess rising to a better version of yourself. Uh, thank you so much. Bye. Such a great question, Dorothy. Um, very similar question that we get asked um, quite often is a version of how do I know when I'm done? How do I know when I'm healed? When do I get there? Right? This, this concept of ideal um, is what I want to speak to first. And I want to acknowledge to Dorothy and all of us out there that are searching for the ideal, for the doneness. I used to call it my, ut my utopian hippie hammock in the sky. <laughs> I've yet to find that place. Um, again, this is anytime we throw those adjectives around, those qualifiers, we're in a, in a state of judgment as giving ourselves this idea that we're not yet there, right? And this false idea that there is a there to get to. And like Jenna and I were just offering, there is no there. We are ever evolving creatures. So again, this idea of ideal, anyone else who's thinking or looking for this ideal, you know, marker of when I know I'm a fully conscious being, let's throw that term away. And let's also honor that consciousness isn't a light switch as much of us would like it to be. We don't discover the practice of consciousness, turn on the light of consciousness and never slip back into our unconscious reactivity. Um, we go in and out of it. And to speak to Dorothy's point, a lot of us shift out of consciousness and we go to those more deeper emotional centers in our subconscious where we react when we're hurt, when one of those deeper wounds are activated, right? When we're going about life in our partnerships or in our world and people around us are activating deeper parts of ourself. Those for me are still the moments where I slip out of my conscious state, um, when my wound, like I shared earlier, of being not considered is really activated and when I don't have the resources to stay conscious and to choose new choices in those moments, I myself go unconscious. I'm talking about resources and what we mean when we say resources are physical resources. Do I have energy? Have I slept? Have I eaten? Emotionally, do I have the bandwidth to see all of those older reactions, to feel maybe that deeper wound bubbling up to the surface and to still stay conscious? to still use all of those calories that I now need to use to be fired up from my prefrontal cortex and make a new choice. And what I've seen in myself is when I don't have those resources, when I'm tired, when I'm stressed, when I'm not doing all the things that I know keep me grounded, I'm much more likely to shift into that unconscious state or that reactive state, especially whenever whatever is happening in the world, I'm perceiving as a moment indicating how not considered I am. So we shift in and out of consciousness. Our goal, of course, in each moment is to find that conscious grounding, to find the present moment, even as I feel the discomfort, you know, the large emotions bubbling up to the surface, honoring that they came from a very real place for me, right? Learning how to find the present moment is important for two reasons. The entirety of this episode, so that we can make choice so that we can create a space where we don't have to allow our subconscious reactions to be what happens next, where we can stand from our conscious mind and again, make choices that are most in alignment with our needs in that moment. The second reason the present moment is so important is because especially when we're dealing with those older woundings or those traumas, they originate it when we didn't feel safe. So what's happening in that moment when they're activated again, oftentimes in our adulthoods, which is, you know, several years, decades from when maybe that 
first instance happened, we still feel unsafe. We're reacting from a, a threat-based place. So the present moment is, is grounding. It actually allows us to create safety. So as we've been describing, finding the hook on my breath, finding the hook on my senses, my sensory experience of whatever's happening. For a lot of us, the reason why we call it grounding, it can actually restabilize safety in the present moment. Because what we come to realize, a lot of what we're reliving are past moments that actually aren't mapping on to what's happening in front of us. So the current moment allows us to expand into choice. And also for those of us, as we will see, it's harder to not react when my deeper wounds are activated. The, the best action I can take for myself is to reestablish safety. And safety for most of us is in that current moment. This conversation about embodying or bringing our bodies back to safety comes up a lot in the circle. And I just want to close out reiterating again these, these tools for grounding. One of the initial courses inside our self-healer circle is called Awaken Consciousness. And it really takes you through a few steps to refer back to over and over again to come back to those senses. So if you are watching or are listening and thinking, okay, well, what are some of those tools? Great, I'm in the present moment. Well, do a scan and go through your senses. Maybe name three things that you can see in the room if you are able to see. Name the thing, the, the way that your drink tastes if you're able to taste it. If there's a smell in the air, maybe name actually out loud or to yourself two or three things that you are able to smell. If you're typing at a keyboard, maybe stop and notice, I feel the keyboard underneath my fingertips and actually feel those things. So we're doing a scan from head to toe of our senses. And actually, I think it's powerful to speak out loud. You know, I am feeling the ground beneath my feet. I feel the hot steam coming off of my tea. I hear the birds chirping around me. So we're actually going through and making a statement for each of these senses that allows us to ground in our bodies and actually embody and be conscious in the present moment. Thank you, Jenna. Those are such incredibly powerful and important tools to begin to utilize to find the present moment, especially when we're feeling unsafe. Um, we're going to talk a lot in our next episode mm -hmm. as we dive into chapter three, a new theory of trauma, really honoring the reality that so many of us from a very deep place, again, in our subconscious, don't feel safe. A lot of us are living in cycles of reactivity that were formed in times where we were experiencing what I call trauma. So stay tuned next week. We're definitely going to talk about a much more expanded definition of trauma that I think for a lot of us offers an explanation with why we're so stuck, really highlights the importance of using these grounding tools. We will have the same question and answer as we've had for each of these episodes in the masterclass. So if you would like to call and leave us your questions for chapter three, a new theory of trauma, the phone number is 213-375-8385. We'll also put that number on the screen. Call us, leave us your name, your location, and leave a voicemail with your question for Chapter 3, A New Theory of Trauma. And we will see and hear from you, or you'll hear from us next Sunday. Mm -hmm.